is a Jasonus. That is the one thought that raced through Betty and Bonnie Hill's minds as they drove home one night in New Hampshire's white mountain area. It was a September night, very dark, 1961. They hadn't seen a car for miles. And a strange light in the sky seemed to follow them. When they finally got home, at dawn, at Portsmouth where they lived, they were far from relieved. Now they felt dirty, their watches had stopped working, Barney's shoes were all scuffed, and Betty's dress was torn and ripped. There were two hours of that drive that they could not remember. But what had happened? Well, with the help of a psychiatrist, the very quiet, reserved couple actually revealed a startling story. Queer beans with huge eyes had walked them into a metallic disc. As wide, Betty said, as a house was long. Once inside, the beans examined the couple and erased their memories. Now their experience would kick off an Air Force inquiry, part of the secretive initiative project Blue Book that investigated UFO sightings. And this was across the whole country. The incident would also become the first ever widely publicized alien abduction story and shape how stories like it were told and understood from then on. Debate continues to this very day as to whether the husband and wife were liars, fantasists, Crackpots are simply sleep deprived. So let's go back to what happened to them. So the hills, um, they went on a road trip and it was very, very spontaneous. Um, and it was a well earned break because Barney had decided the couple needed as explained in the book, The Interrupted Journey, a 1966 book that they collaborated on with another author. Now Barney was working a grueling night shift at the post office. And he was driving 60 miles every day. Betty's job handling state welfare cases was not much easier. The little free time that they had was crucial and they'd been so devoted to their church and activities related to the civil rights movement. After 16 months of marriage, Betty and Barney saw this trip through Montreal and Niagara Falls as their delayed honeymoon. They left so impulsively, they had no time to go to the bank before closed for the weekend. So they got in their car with less than $70 in their pockets. Now, 
Now on the last night of their three-day trip, the tired couple sipped coffee in a Vermont diner to recharge their batteries before driving back. Barney figured that if they pushed through, they could beat the wind and the rains from an approaching hurricane. And they left the diner around 10 p.m., estimating that they would reach their red-framed house in Portsmouth, New Hampshire between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. at the latest. Now, as they drove, a strange light appeared in the sky above them, and it gave them a reason to hurry. At first it looked like a falling star, but it grew larger and brighter with every mile. Barney was an avid plane watcher and also a World War II veteran. So he was sure that they had nothing to worry about. It's just a satellite, he assured Betty. These things happen all the time and it's probably gone off course. However, the light seemed to move with the car. And as Barney steered down the curving mountain road, the light zigzagged ducking past the moon and behind the trees and the mountain edges. But then it would reappear moments later. Sometimes it seemed to move forward in front of them as if it was playing a game of cat and mouse. It seemed to be an illusion, they thought. Maybe... The car's movement made it seem like the light too was moving. All these thoughts seemed to cross over their mind. Curiosity overcame them. The couple pulled over at road stops and picnic turnouts to get a closer look. Through binoculars, Betty saw that the white light was actually an object spinning in the air spinning in the air Barney, she told her husband if you think that's a satellite or a star you're being completely ridiculous now he knew that she was right because Barney had an IQ of 140 Barney was also a pragmatic man who wouldn't give flying saucers a second thought. The night was too quiet for it to be a helicopter, a commercial plane or even a military jet. Now he didn't want to spook Betty, but he was becoming concerned. Very concerned. What was this light? And why was it toying with them? So, about 17 miles after the diner, the object hovered just above the treetops, approximately 100 feet in the air above them. Barney abruptly stopped the car. Keeping the engine running, he shoved a handgun that he'd hidden beneath the seat into his pocket and rushed into a dark field. Now Betty was in the car at this point, but what he saw was as big as a jet, but round and flat, like a, like a pancake. God, he thought, what is this thing? He recalled thinking, this can't be real. Behind rows of windows, 
queer uniform beings seemed to look right out at him. Barney recalled he tried to lift his hand to his pistol, but somehow he couldn't. A voice told him to put down his binoculars. He had a startling thought that ran through his brain. We're about to be captured. Yelling hysterically, he ran back to the car and barreled down the road as Betty tracked the craft, craning her head outside of the car window. Without explanation, a loud rhythmic beep sounded from the car's trunk. The couple left instantly drowsy and losing consciousness. Now they came around two hours later and 35 miles down the road. Now, back home in Portsmouth, they tried to make sense of the night that they had encountered. Barney felt compelled to examine his lower body off, and both seemed aware of a, a puzzling presence. In the weeks and months afterwards, Betty, an avid reader, checked out books from the library concerning civilian UFO group. This was the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon. And she reported the sighting to the Air Force to worried about radiation. In the coming years, with Betty suffering from disturbing dreams and, and Barney developing an ulcer and anxiety, the couple sought mental help. The two met with Benjamin Simon, a psychiatrist and a neurologist who specialised in hypnosis and mainstream technique at the time. Through months of weekly sessions, Simon helped the couple piece together what they think had happened. A vessel had landed in the hill's car, putting them to sleep. And afterward, great beans walked them up a long ramp and into a spaceship. Now once inside, the hills had been separated and taken turns in an examination room that had curved walls and a bright light hanging from the ceiling. Now each was asked to climb up on a metal table and the table was so short Barney's legs hung over the side of it. Now, during the examinations, the bean removed Betty and Barney's clothes and plucked strands of their hair, took clippings from their nails and scraped their skin. Each sample was placed on a clear material, not unlike a glass slide. Needles connected to long wires probed their heads, arms, legs and spines. One large needle, around six inches long, was inserted into Betty's belly. The pregnancy test left her twisting in pain. Throughout, a being Betty and Barney called the leader watched from the side. After Betty's examination ended, the beings rushed back into her room, excited. They had discovered that Barney's teeth could be removed. Betty laughed, explaining that Barney had dentures, a fact of human aging the beings struggled to understand. Later, along with the leader, Betty asked where the craft had flown, admitting that she knew little of the universe. The 
being joked with her, saying that if you don't know where you are, there wouldn't be any point in telling you where I am. Later, under hypnosis, she drew a star map shown to her on the ship. In 1965, the Hill story was picked up by a Boston newspaper. And after that, everything changed. The quiet couple story became the subject of a best-selling book and a movie starring James Earl Jones. The upstanding civil servants have become celebrities or celebrity abductees. Now the Hills were not the first to spot a UFO or even to report an abduction. But this story did capture the nation's imagination and was so widely publicised. It helps shape how we talk about alien encounters and abductions to this very day. Now, before the Hill story, alien encounters were friendly, according to Christopher Bader, professor of sociology at California's Chapman University. Some aliens even lived on Earth and commuted back on weekends. But once the Hill story became better known, abduction accounts shared certain characteristics such as medical examinations and missing time. Aliens with large heads and big eyes, dubbed greys in UFO circles, became the classic science fiction staples in personal accounts and pop culture, such as movies like um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and, much later, The X-Files. The Hill story, and those that came afterwards, helped pave the way for a new understanding of human experience. Richard J. McNally, a Harvard psychologist, put it this way, The alien abduction phenomenon, in my opinion, shows how sincere, non-psychotic individuals can develop beliefs about, and false memories of incredible experiences that never happened. Experts of all stripes have tried to explain why intelligent, otherwise mentally stable people have come forward with these experiences. Many psychologists even say sleep paralysis and hallucinations played a role, leading questions about hypnosis the main way most abductees unlock their stories could also have been a factor. So, those who report alien abduction might need to see the world a little differently. And, according to research, one of the strongest predictors of false recall is a vivid imagination. This group scores high in magical ideation and is more likely to believe in ghosts than tarot readings, according to McNally. But some do believe the Hill story is simply a myth in the making, with the supernatural beings and vulnerable protagonists and otherworldly journeys are often the hallmarks of legend. Now many point to the stress of being an interracial couple living in a predominantly white state in a turbulent era. So, just to rewind there, the year of the hypnosis was 1964, which was marked by Cold War tensions and civil rights unrest, and numerous urban riots were erupting that summer. You have a biracial couple at a time where obviously it was not easy to be a biracial couple, says Bader. So look at those aliens, a mixture of black and white. I find that very meaningful. Now, 
abductee stories depend on first-hand accounts and the most vulnerable form of evidence. Memories can be distorted by stress or distraction. When a false memory um, is in place, psychologists say, the brain works to fill in the details. Now, of course, another explanation is always possible, and that is that the hills were abducted by aliens. The hills stuck to their story, despite years of skeptics and detractors. Now, like many abductees, the couple never felt false memory as sleep paralysis explained what they had experienced. And Betty became a known voice in UFO research and claimed that she was visited multiple times in the decades to follow. Do you believe the Hill story? Perhaps you can let me know in the comments below. It would be good to hear what you think of this story. Now I heard of this many, many years ago and it's just nice to have a chance to retell the story to yourselves. But do let me know, it's a fascinating subject. I do want to ask, however, why do people no longer get abducted by aliens? It just seems to have stopped, don't you think? But still, like I said, it's a fascinating discussion. Thank you for listening tonight.